This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening. Thank you so much for braving this cold, windy night and coming out to learn about the rhythms of the heart. Both uh, Dr. Marcus, my colleague, and myself were very much interested in uh, this uh, area. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is a separate subspecialty now. It's ca called cardiac electrophysiology, and it's, um, it's an extremely important uh, element in the management of our patients with, uh, uh, with cardiac uh, disease. Um, what I have prepared is an animated session. Uh, there's animations here that was prepared by a computer genius, and uh, I hope you find it interesting. So in this uh, first uh, diagram, the point that I want to make is that the heart, as you recall, has four chambers, two upper chambers and two lower pumping chambers. And the, there are basically two components to normal heart action. First, you have to have electrical activity that spreads through the heart. And this acts as a signal for first contraction of the upper chambers, which fill the lower pumping chambers. That's the way God put us together. You have an electrical spark that uh, initiates contraction of the top chambers, and then once the top chambers, are, the, uh, top chambers have emptied and there's adequate filling of the bottom chambers, then you get a uh, mechanical uh, a contraction. And um, this is the electrical cardiogram, this is the electrocardiogram which your doctor uh, will inscribe uh, while you're being examined to uh, assess the electrical activity of your heart muscle. And so this is what the heart looks like if you were to examine it. And if we peel away the heart muscle, then we see the electrical system of the heart. This is the specialized conducting system of the heart. And the electrical impulse will usually begin in the region of what's called the sinus node. This is a little football-like structure, and it sits at the top of the right atrium, okay? It sits right up over here. And as you'll see in a moment, it el elaborates signals at about 60 to 100 times per minute. That's the normal heart rate. It's, the, it's called the pacemaker of the heart. It's the pacemaker because it discharges more rapidly than any of the other subsidiary pacemakers. The electrical activity then spreads through the specialized conducting system, through a region called the AV node, the His bundle, the common bundle, and then each of the, and then the signal is distributed to each of the ventricles, to the right ventricle and to the left ventricle. And um, so here's what it might look like. So here's the sinus node, AV node, the His bundle, right bundle, left bundle. And the electrical impulse, as you see, discharges the top chambers. It spreads very rapidly through the specialized conducting system and activates the bottom of the heart. OK? Is that clear to everybody? This is how the system works. Now, sometimes your doctors will say, oh, I looked at your EKG, and I found that there was disruption of 
conduction to the right ventricle, you have a right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block pattern. There's an enormous amount of information that you can learn from looking at the, uh, at the electrocardiographic uh, tracings. Okay? So this is the normal. Now, some of the times, our patients come to us with a history of dizzy spells or blackout spells. And at times, this can be due to the fact that there is slowing of the heart rate. We said that the normal heart rate is from 60 to 100 beats per minute. Well, what happens if the heart rate drops precipitously to 30 beats per minute or 20 beats per minute? Then there is inadequate blood flow to the brain and one might get dizzy or, or black out. Now, nowadays, <clears throat> we have devices that we can send our patients home with. We call these event recorders. You can send the patient home, and if they're having dizzy spells, we ask them to press the button, and we can, from the time you press the button till we examine the EKG, we, we correlate this, we can see whether the patient has had <coughs> something like a drop beat, as you see here. See, here's a normal beat. Here's the top chamber. Here's the bottom chamber. Here's the top chamber. Here's nothing, okay? And if this results in a slow enough heart rate, the patient may get dizzy turns or may actually uh, collapse. And here's an example of a much more serious condition. So here's a patient that's going along in the normal rate, and the cause of this person's collapse is, notice that the uh, top chamber is beating and nothing goes through to the ventricle. We call this AV block. And um, these patients, if it goes on in the, in the upright position for more than six seconds, they will in fact collapse. Now, most often, fortunately, there is a residual pacemaker somewhere in the ventricle that will take over and save save their lives. But the residual pacemaker is oftentimes unreliable and very slow. So the patients are very symptomatic, but, but oftentimes, most of the time, they can get to the hospital for uh, definitive care. Now, the definitive care would be insertion of a pacemaker. How many of you here have a pacemaker or know of a friend who has a pacemaker? See, very common, very common. Right? And I can tell you, even though I look young, I, <laughs> I went to uh, medical school in the 50s before there were pacemakers. And this was, if someone came in with complete AV block, it was like a death sentence. It was the most horrible thing to treat because there was nothing we could do. We could watch them go into complete block and at the time, what we have was some medicines, these sublingual isoprel pills, which they could take to speed the heart rate up, but then it would speed the heart rate up too much. And they would develop worrisome uh, rapid rhythms. Uh, we did have devices that could shock your chest and bring on a heartbeat, but it was so bad that at times people would tear them off and they'd rather die. So the advent of something that we take for granted very commonly. Uh, pacemakers are very easy to in insert. Um, you go into the hospital, you get it done, you're home the next day. And what it involves is, as shown here, the, uh, the uh, physician will insert a wire into the vein and feed it right into the heart. This is connected to a little battery. These batteries are about this size now and this thin. They're very thin and in most moderately built uh, uh, people, you don't even uh, notice it. So it's quite remarkable. And what this is, is like implanting a nurse in your chest. And every time the heart rate goes below whatever rate is set by the battery, the pacemaker will come in and save you. So it's quite remarkable. So these are one type of rhythm that we deal with. People who come in with slowing of the heart rate where we use a pacemaker uh, function, okay? Now, another type of rhythm that's very important are fast rhythms, okay? And we're gonna be talking about what's called here supraventricular arrhythmias. And these are heart rhythms that are coming from above 
the ventricles, from above the pumping chambers. It's coming from the right or left atria, the top chambers. Is that clear to everyone? So we're first talking about supraventricular tachycardias. And <clears throat> there, there, there are a lot of names that I'm going to throw out uh, to you. There's, there are those patients who come in with paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias, and all that means is that the patient is perfectly well, and then all of a sudden they feel, boom, the heartbeat is r racing, and they think they're going to die, uh, and then the tachycardia will go away just as suddenly. Okay? So what you'll feel is palpitations that, that come on suddenly and dissipate just as suddenly. And then we have other rhythms called atrial flutter. We're going to uh, just say a word about atrial fibrillation because that's the most common of these heart rhythms. It's so common, in fact, that uh, we're going to have a whole separate lecture related to atrial fibrillation this evening, and I won't, uh, uh, I won't uh, talk about that uh, very much. Okay, now, why do we have these fast rhythms? And this, again, is another remarkable story. Um, we know that the patients are born with little twigs. They're microscopic, and they connect the top chamber, this is the atrium, with the ventricle, this is the bottom chamber, and this is these little muscular connections. Now normally, when the heart, when the, when the fetus develops, everybody has these muscular connections, okay? And then as the fetus matures, they shrivel away, except for one in 2,000 or so live births, these little fibers will remain. And these fibers will form the nidus of um, a heart rhythm disorders that I'll demonstrate to you in a moment. Okay? So just keep this in mind that some one in 2,000 or so people have these accessory connections in their hearts. And these accessory connections, if you just look down on the heart, just tear away the upper part of the heart, these, these uh, little connections can occur anywhere in the heart, anywhere in the heart. And your physician will oftentimes be able to recognize that these connections exist because there'll be telltale signs on the EKG that he takes or he, she, that she takes uh, that shows you uh, evidence of what we call a delta wave or pre-excitation. Uh, I wouldn't worry about this so much, but I want you to understand why you get an abnormal EKG. You get the abnormal EKG because the impulse coming from the sinus node, instead of just conducting over the normal, it conducts us over both, and so you get a fusion of impulses, and that's what we can see on the EKG. We can look at the EKG and say, oh, this person has been born with an accessory pathway, and there's a potential for mischief here, okay? Now, why do they have mischief? Well, here's, the, here's what happens if an impulse goes down both pathways, okay? No problem. Okay, but now suppose you have a premature beat that blocks in one pathway and goes down the other, downs the normal, do you see? And comes back up the accessory pathway. This is called a re-entrant tachycardia or a circus movement tachycardia. You see, the way we're put together is you should only have one pathway. You should only have one pathway between top and bottom. If you have two pathways, then you could have mischief. Okay, let's repeat it because this is really neat. Okay, so here's the impulse and it goes down both and there's no problem. Do you all appreciate that? Okay, then we have a little terrorist, an atrial prima, an extra beat, which blocks here, but it goes down the normal, okay, and then back up, and now the normal is ready to accept it, and this gives you your fast heart rhythm. And that explains why the patients are perfectly well until suddenly they get the premature beat that triggers the fast heart rhythm, okay? So this is someone who has WPW, Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome. These were the uh, physicians who, do, who well described this uh, particular syndrome. And this is um, one of the important causes 
for uh, these uh, rapid uh, tachycardias. Now, um, it was also long appreciated that these patients can have very serious heart rhythm disorders, and actually there is a mortality associated with it, particularly if they develop uh, other rhythms from the top chambers, atrial fibrillation, they can develop very, very rapid heart rates and are at risk for, for death with this. So that's very important, and that's why when we uh, examine a patient who has uh, the WPW syndrome and they have these rapid rhythms, we do recommend very aggressive treatment, which I'll describe in a moment. Okay? Now, another remarkable advance that we've been fortunate enough to, to live and see and de help, help develop is the fact that you can take your catheter um, at the time of studying these patients who come in with life-threatening heart rhythm disorders, find out where the pathway is. We find this uh, out electrically, by electrically examining the, the heart, and we can actually um, induce electrical current, we call it radio frequency energy, to burn out these pathways. So here we have a person who has a pathway here on the right side of the heart, and you see the physician has put the catheter in this area, burned this out, and notice that the, the uh, telltale sign of pre-excitation goes away. It melts right in front of your eyes. And this is absolutely dramatic, because uh, uh, Dr. Marcus and I, we're really incredible, we're just enchanted by this. We have a young person, uh, they're told you can't play tennis, you can't play soccer, you can't do this, can't do that, or you have to take this pill or that pill, and you can cure them. You take them to the laboratory, you find out what the problem is, and they're cured. It's absolutely remarkable. Okay, now another even more common problem is something called AV node reentry. And the idea is, is really very similar to what I described for the patients with accessory pathways, except they occur in the region of the AV node. You can have reentry the same pathology, but within the AV node itself. And these patients can also come in with the abrupt onset of palpitations, palpitations, abrupt offset of the palpitations. And again, um, nowadays we can treat them with medicines, but more often these are young people. We don't like to um, uh, have them take medicines for the rest of their lives, and so we, there are ablative procedures where we can just put our catheter in and put it in a certain position and destroy the um, extra pathway. Again, it's just quite remarkable that we can do these things with, uh, by, by catheter for the appropriate person. I'm going to say a word <clears throat> about another heart rhythm that comes from the top chambers, and that's called atrial flutter. Okay? And atrial flutter, again, in years uh, bygone was, uh, number one, very common, particularly as we grew older, and it was very incapacitating at times and very difficult to treat. These patients would have to come in again and again for cardioversions. We would bring them into the hospital, shock them into normal rhythm because of, uh, they had recurrences. Now, this is a heart rhythm disorder that involves the muscles around the valve around the right-sided valve. We call it a tricuspid valve. So here's where the mischief is. They go round and round, and they produce uh, very rapid rates. And again, there are very important techniques where we can uh, just create a line and break up this flutter circuit. Okay? This is very easily done in the lab. Not all flutter circuits are that, this easy to, to break up, but this is the most common one. And again, ablation is uh, very, very effective, much more effective than uh, the drug, uh, drug therapy. Okay. Uh, this is uh, atrial fibrillation, which we're not going to say much about, except to say it, it involves the top chambers and there's irregularly irregular activity. There's no rhyme or reason. This is what, and this is the most common um, uh, arrhythmia that we are uh, uh, caused to, that we, that we have to treat. And um, I'm not gonna 
say anything about uh, various treatments, but there, more recently there are techniques where we can actually uh, cure atrial fibrillation, which is resistant to drug uh, therapy. Now, in closing, I do want to uh, emphasize one other thing, and that is the electrical activity of the heart is dependent on the fact that there are pores or channels in the membrane that lines heart muscle. So normally, heart muscle is lined by what we call a bimolecular lipid layer, okay? And this is um, a fatty la layer that's impervious to water or electrolytes. And there could be no conduction of electrical activity through this uh, layer. The thing that allows for electricity to flow from cell to cell are these pores or channels. So that um, if you put a, an electrode into the cell, the cell would be uh, uh, at, a, at a level of minus 90 millivolts. And then when you depolarize the cell, we have movement of, of ions. These are sodium channels. I don't care whether you remember it. Uh, and then uh, once the sodium channel depolarizes the cell, then uh, other ions move in, calcium, and then the process is reversed because you have um, outward movement of potassium channels. Now, the, the, the individual uh, channels, I don't care if you remember, what I want you to get a feel for is that the normal electrical activity depends on normal channel function. And the, there are a variety of uh, patients who have genetic causes for very serious heart rhythm disorders. For example, there are patients with bo who are born with abnormal genes that produce abnormal potassium channels that will greatly distort the normal electrical activity and produce life-threatening arrhythmias. And these are the kids that might drop dead suddenly uh, on the basketball court, etc., because they may, they may have an inborn error or genetic error, genetic mutation that causes uh, mischief. You're going to learn more about that uh, next week with the lecture on sudden death. But I just wanted to introduce this. Here's a patient who has one of the more common of the genetic disorders. It's known as the long QT syndrome. And again, your physician will be able to make the diagnosis just looking at the uh, electrocardiogram. And these patients can have very serious heart rhythm disorders. You see, this is the normal, this is the normal, and you can see this is a life-threatening, very rapid ventricular uh, disorder. The other thing that I wanted to introduce is the idea of mischief arising from the bottom chambers, and this is a lot more serious. Most often, these fast heart rhythms, which are known as tachycardias, and if they arise from the ventricle, we call it ventricular tachycardias, most of the time, they occur in people who have had a prior heart attack. Prior heart attack leaves a scar, and within the scar, there are channels which allow for electrical activity, giving you these re-entrant arrhythmias. And these can be treated first with medicines. Number one, if the medicines don't work, we can put catheters in and try to ablate these abnormal pathways. And um, we also can use something called a defibrillator where, where, again, you put a device in, it senses when you see these very, very rapid uh, heart rhythm disorders and, and delivers a shock, much as the, in the EMTs that you watch on television, they give a shock externally and convert the rhythm to normal. This can be done with a defibrillator. So these are the remarkable things. You'll learn a lot more about that uh, when we uh, have our session next week uh, on, on sudden death. So what I think I shall do now is stop and uh, try to answer any of your questions, and then we'll go on to the second part of the program. So any questions about the normal heart rhythms, slow heart rhythms, and the fast heart rhythms that we've talked about? Okay. Okay, good question. So. The uh, question was, um, what is the tachybrady syndrome? Now, what happens at times is in the top chamber, as we age, 
you can have fibrosis or scarring of the sinus node area and also the surrounding atrium. And so what happens is, because the sinus node is sick, uh, it slows down, so you can get slow heart rhythms. And because you have this uh, fibrosis, you can get reentrant circuits in the atrium. So you can have tacky Brady syndrome. Now, in the old days, this was very difficult to treat because any time we'd use medicines, we would maybe control the fast rhythm and the slow rhythms would become a problem. So one way of treating it is to put in a pacemaker to control the uh, slow rhythms and then give whatever drugs we need to control it. So that's the way we try to manage it. But it, it, was, it was, this was quite a while ago, so we used quinidine. It was very effective. Yeah, in the old, days, the old days we used quinidine. Nowadays we don't use that very much anymore. It's very rare. But yeah, we do use quinidine. We did use quinidine. It was a rough drug to take because it had gastrointestinal side effects. Okay, question, I should repeat the question. So question was, the impulse seems to travel by nerves. The scar tissue uh, have nerves in it. Excellent question. The ordinary activity is conducted by specialized tissue. They're not nerves. They're myocardial cells, but they're specialized. They're, they have different ionic currents, and they're attuned to allowing for rapid conduction. The scarred area doesn't have any nerves. But what happens is with the scarred area, it sets up reentrant circuits. So an impulse can approach the scarred area in one direction and block, go around through the channels through the scar, and give you a reentry. The, the principle is exactly the same as what I described for the WPW, only think of it as a scar, a scarred area. It's not homogeneously scarred. If it was homogeneously scarred, you can't get a rhythm disorder. But what happens is you have normal channels through the scar, and this sets up reentry. OK, so the question is, can you say anything about sinus node dysfunction and fibrillation? And that's very close to the tachycardia, uh, bradycardia syndrome, or sick sinus syndrome. Uh, frequently, people who have disease of the sinus node will also have, histologically, when you look at the, the heart after the patient has passed, you can see fibrosis or scarring involving not only the sinus node, but the atrium. And this gives you the onlogger or the substrate for fibrillation as well as bradycardia. There are um, atrial tachycardias, OK? And these are a little different from what I've described uh, today. These are the, uh, of the l less common causes of supraventricular tachycardia, rapid tachycardias from the top chambers. And here you can look at it as irritable areas in the top chambers that just beat more rapidly. And if you don't have an accessory pathway, they're usually not a big danger. And as a matter of fact, if you take these 24-hour recordings, you'll frequently see people who have short bursts of, quotes atrial tachycardia, and you may not treat it at all. Sometimes they're a nuisance, and we use drugs for it. But that is the third most common cause of uh, supraventricular tachycardia. The most common is the AV node reentry. The second is an accessory pathway. The third is atrial tachycardia.